record it. And then I'm also going to use my telephone to record it, technology these days. Well, here we go. Um, listen, I, I wanted to just say, I wanted to start by asking how have you been during this extraordinary quarantine time with the virus? How have you been spending your time musically? What has been happening with you? Well, I have been practicing on the piano. There's an excellent Steinway seven foot here. And uh, so I most recently, I learned the sonata opus two number three of Beethoven. And now I am beginning to look at another sonata. <laughs> so that, that I, I have spent my time well. That's, that's wonderful. Listen, um, I, I wanted to ask you, um, so I have a lot of topics that I would like to discuss with you today and it's very formal. So feel free to add in anything you like. Um, for me, what interests me most, you have um, virtually a century behind you of observing American and global concert life. Yeah. And I'm curious, what does the, um, the performance, the recital, the solo piano scene look like today versus say in the 1940s and 1950s, how many recitals there are, the type of repertoire that is played, anything that comes to mind to you? Well, I have seen a lot of different audiences. The most important thing, no matter what the performer plays, no matter whether it is classical or whether it is jazz, whether it is anything, it must reach the heart of the audience. It cannot just be inside of a performer. Yeah. The performer's job is to turn whatever is in his heart, to turn it and give it to the audience as well as he or she can. And over the years, the longer you do it, the more capable you become at doing this. And because I have lived for a very long time, I became more and more capable to reach my audience. Now, of course, you have to have a great deal of technique to do this. Yeah. Technique in mastering your instrument. Mine is piano. So in the early days, I concentrated mainly on building a technique that would allow me to show the audience how beautiful the music is. Yes. And I concentrated working between eight and nine hours a day for most of my life in order to have the technique to be able to demonstrate my music to my audience. And then in the later years, I grew less capable because I was too old and cannot do with agility what I could do for many, many years before that. But I am more capable of showing my feelings to the public than I was before. So there, it, one way I became less able, but more knowledgeable in other ways. Yeah. I hope you can follow. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, listen, you, you touched on something that I've been curious about for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so often I think professors, teachers and conservatories um, will say things like, and actually not just professors, I know Arthur Rubinstein mm -hmm. was once known to have said, oh, don't, it, no one should need practice more than three or four hours, I need that much. And certainly we hear this echoed by a lot of conservatories. You know, they, they talk a lot about moderation, only practicing, say, as, as far as the mind can concentrate. Of course, I know a great artist like, like yourself or others like Rudolf Serkin and Richter who 
uh, productively and famously have gotten up to hours, or William Capel, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 hours per day. So I, I know it's maybe the most overrated question, the most simplistic question, but what are your thoughts on, on hourly practicing hours per day? How much the mind can take, how much you should keep going when you feel mental fatigue, these things. And I know you're someone who put in countless hours, nine hours, 10 hours for a significant portion of your life. Well, I'm glad I did. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't, you don't feel, you don't regret any of it. You don't feel like you could have done the job with half that amount of hours or? I couldn't have because now I have a pretty dependable technique. I'm 96 years old. Yeah. But still I can play. We're I glad can, you did too. I yeah. can play pretty well, not mm -hmm. perfectly. Right. But I can play pretty well so that any audience will understand what I am trying to say. Yeah, I agree. Um, I was wondering if, so we also know that you're um, one of the la last students um, of Rachmaninoff and yes. Corto. And so I was wondering if um, you could speak a little bit about your studies with him and you know anything from not not just limited to his musical advice but anything you remember about the man about the meetings about the experience anything that comes to mind well mr rothmaninoff i knew when i was a tiny girl just the summers of 1934 and 1935 the reason i say the summers because Neither of us had concerts to play during the summertime. And so this is a, a working time for most pianists because we learn during the summer, except for the play the occasional concert with orchestra for a festival here or for a festival there. That, does, that just uh, an occasional interruption during the summer because usually the summertime it's a learning time. And for me, it certainly was a learning time. I used the summers to learn a program and a concerto every year when I was nine years old, and when I was 10 years old, when I was 11. They aren't the same programs that I play today, but in those days, they were adequate for a young person to play. Also, Mr. Rachmaninoff, it just happened at that particular time, was living in Switzerland. His home was not far from Paris. And in Paris, he had relatives. He had a niece. And the niece's name was Madame Canius. So because Mr. Rachmaninoff's wife was not faring well at that time. Her health was delicate. He did not want for her to listen to him practice because he was a very great believer in many hours of practice. He practiced as many as 17 hours. Right, and I, if I can, I, I hear that that's um, another one of these rumors. Rachmaninoff is someone who has been rumored to never practice or you know learn things en route to a concert on a train. So it's wonderful that we're hearing this um, yeah. you know, denial of the room. He was a worker. He was a hard worker. Slow practice, very slow, so that he could hear every single note that he played and analyze it harmonically and make it as musical as possible to fit into the context of the music he was presenting. Yes. Very, very slow. And I know that um, you probably know this story as well. There's a well-known story about um, the writer Abram Chazin, who had an appointment with Mr. Rachmaninoff, and he approached um, Rachmaninoff's door in Beverly Hills, and he heard Rachmaninoff practicing the Chopin double thirds etude at excruciatingly slow speed, and 
you know, this, this story gets passed around a lot in the pedagogical community to show how slow he worked and how painstakingly he worked. And I know from your book, you also say he was a believer in metronome practice a lot. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad to have the modern metronome that can advance your speed by one number at a time, because this is a musician's dream to be able to advance the yeah. metronome according to his wish rather than according to what the metronome used to be, you know, the old metronome that went uh, from side to side. You could only stop the metronome where the metronome could stop, like 100, 104, 108, 112, 116, 120, then 126, 132, 144. This is not good because the faster you go, no, yeah. the slower you should be able to advance yourself. So you have to be rather ingenious to use one of those old metronomes. Yeah. I'm lucky to live in an age when you can have a metronome that you can stop by ones. One. So that was something, you know, I had. Um, I had heard of you already for several years, but I remember I became interested in your teaching and your pedagogy when I discovered music yeah. at your fingertips yeah. um, in 2007 at the Manhattan School of Music Library. And I read your chapter about practicing and I found it, I found it fascinating because to, to someone as yourself, you worked at such a painstaking level. As you just said, you, you work on a difficult passage by increasing the metronome by one. Yes. By one. And then at the end of your practice period, you go back and then you increase it by threes. And then again, you start at the same slow tempo, increasing it by fives or sixes. Yes. And is this still a way that you work to this day? Yes, I recommend that. Yeah, I, I, I recommend it to my students too. And of course, I always tell, and I've heard about increasing passages with the metronome, but not by such uh, severity of just one number at a time. So I think that's quite fascinating. And I just think something I found interesting is a lot of, you know, a lot of students have trouble uh, memorizing or they have fears with memorization. And you talk about how practicing at, at so many different tempos at, at, from such a slow speed forces the brain to hear a passage so many times at such a different speed, it really breaks into the subconscious and that's solves true. memory issues or takes away the fear of memory issues. That's <laughs> yeah. yeah. Were your lessons with Mr. Rachmaninoff in English when he would speak to you? In French. In French, okay. I'd wondered this thing before. I was glad for that because my father sat through the lesson and he could not understand everything that went on because both of us could speak French and we spoke it quickly enough and easily enough for him not to be able to follow. Ah, sneaky. <laughs> Um, and you, if also, if I, if I research correctly, you also did have some lessons with Mr. Corteau. Oh, yes. I worked with Mr. Corteau probably for more than, uh, seven years, but not consistently. You see, I would be in town and then I would have to go away and play concerts and he would have to go away and play concerts, but he always came back. Of course. Mm. Who was your main teacher um, at this time? We know that you had intermittent lessons with Mr. Rachmaninoff and Mr. Corto. Was your father the one who was teaching you primarily or? Well, my father went to all the lessons. Mm -hmm. He didn't understand everything. Okay. He thought he did. Poor man. I think he thought that he was doing me a big thing. How, how did you learn French so quickly? Excuse me? How did you learn French so quickly? I was a child. You are a child, right. Child pick up everything. Yeah. yeah. You see, a, uh, ch a child picks up a language much more quickly than an adult. And I had a great deal of help because my two younger sisters were children who went to school. And anything they came home and were able to say, <laughs> I became able and between us. My two sisters and I learned French very quickly. And also I had a French teacher who came twice a week 
so that I could write in French or I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Uh, I know that you've spent a great deal of your life now teaching. And I'm curious, you, you've given master classes throughout Asia, the United States, and Europe. Do you see any differences in attitude and approach across the continents in, from, to practicing the mentality, anything? Well, the, in the big cities, people are able to hear the best artists play. And so, of course, the big cities are the place where they have the most knowledgeable public. But due to records, recordings, and radio, even in the smaller towns of the United States, people are becoming quite musical, quite musically uh, sophisticated. And I go to Asia now. And I go to the smaller cities of China, perhaps. Mm -hmm. There, they are very willing to learn. They are wanting to learn. They want very much to catch up. They realize there's a lot to learn in uh, Western music, and they want to catch up in this art. Of course. And one thing I had, uh, I had written here, uh, something in my notes that I had wanted to ask you. You were, um, of course, you were a, a child prodigy. And I think something that uh, parents wonder, parents perhaps more than teachers, certainly more than students, how much, um, what amount of pressure is the right amount of pressure to put on a child? And I know there's no answer to this. It depends on the child, it depends on the situation, but um, you were someone who was obviously pushed very hard and you broke through the challenges that were, uh, that were brought on by that. Um, what are your thoughts on putting pressure as a parent and as a teacher on students? And where, where should one draw the line between being strict and being lenient? I've never been a parent, okay. but I have been a teacher and I respect even a child as an individual. And I try to make a friend of the child and I don't want to push them into practice, but I want them to notice what a difference a few exercises can make if they will do the exercises. Yes. And I try to conduct them during the lesson, through the exercise over and over and over again until there is a noticeable improvement. And when I can show them the improvement at the beginning of the lesson, you could only do it with a metronome at such and such a number but we got rid of this mistake. Then we got rid of this mistake. Then we improved it with your fingering. Then we improved it with the way you held your hand. Yeah. Until we got to this point. So you had a wonderful lesson. Yeah. yeah. And in this way, I try to give the person a feeling of accomplishment. And I find that this works pretty well. If you give the student a feeling of accomplishment, then he realizes that the time that they put in wasn't just painful and annoying and something they did not want to do again. It became something that, yes, they did want to do it again and see what kind of improvement they were going to make. Exactly. Um, you know, just now, since we have a lot of teachers watching this, I wanted to ask, uh, get a little bit more specific. Um, I wanted to ask, what are your favorite, if any, um, piano exercises you give, such as, you know, I personally, I, I have practiced uh, Dohnani, Pishna, and Hanan, but I know there are dozens. There are 
Jonas Rachmaninoff had his own exercises. Um, Liszt had his exercises. And of course, there are scales and arpeggios. And no one, and there's Czerny, and no one does all of them. Um, have you studied or assigned, or do you feel partial to any particular exercises? Or do you, if you don't believe in exercises at all? I Some people make do. exercises out of the difficult passages in yeah. repertoire. One of the, yes, and I remember one of the things that I took from music at your fingertips that I became very interested in was your exercises called developers. Yes. <laughs> and I found this fast. It was such a, and just to explain what it is, say if I'm, if I'm passive, if I'm practicing a passage. <laughs> developers, as I understand, you would, you would take an octave passage such as this, and you would take only the first two notes, repeat <laughs> that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One hand alone. One hand, okay, even harder, one hand at a time. So let's right. start the left hand, because the left hand is usually the worst of the two. Let's do the left hand, okay. Then I go from notes two to three. That's right. And, and then, then e, note, Yeah, and then e, uh, three to four. Finger or the third finger and E flat. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after going through this pattern, I I go back to the beginning and I repeat the first three notes. So yeah. now do I do I go back and forth? Do I just yes, continue? back and forth? F sharp so, G G G F sharp G G G. <laughs> something like that but you got you go do you do you go note for note backwards so you don't just play the passage forward you play it backwards as well so you hear it backwards yes yeah and one hand at a time in the passage that's it yeah and i i remember you um describing this exercise as in quotes boring time consuming. However, if done consistently, the possibility of becoming derailed is virtually non-existent. Okay. And I thought that was so, something about that was so comforting to show that it there's a, a level of work one can reach. It's so comforting, so comforting. I know it's, um, good it's a okay. type of- I've spent so much time and effort to make it perfect, but it will be in a, situation. I can attest to that. I mean, I, yeah. I read that and I, so I thought about that and I thought I, I have to try this. And of course, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like something I hadn't tried and I still assign it to my students now. Mm -hmm. um, and for people who are watching um, Ruth's exercise developers is found um, in her book, Music at Your Fingertips yeah. um, in the chapter called More About Practicing. And you also, I know you're also an advocate of practicing with the shifting different accents in yes. a passage. So. And then shifting around different accents within a passage. So, and the metronome and just different ways of working. Yeah. So what do we do when we, what do we do when we practice in all these ways and it still doesn't work? You continue practicing. Okay. You haven't practiced long enough. That's I what like that, yeah. I tried to do maybe in three weeks what it will come to pass within three months. Yeah. It's endless, depending on the difficulty of the material you're working on. So you're an advocate more for making exercises out of the difficult passages. Correct. Rather than. Um, yes. and In this way, you don't waste any time. You use your time to very good advantage because all your time is spent on repertoire that you wish to play. And if you get tired of doing it and you get bored with doing it, it means 
that the passage conquered you because you didn't have sufficient patience. So maybe you should put it aside, and work on something else for a while. And then later you come back to it. Yeah. I remember when I was working on the Tchaikovsky concerto, to me, this was a hugely difficult composition. I could not play the whole first movement consecutively because I didn't have the strength to do it. So I could get about one third of it, one third of the way and call it a day. So I worked on just the first third of the first movement. One third of one movement is all I could do. Then I put that on a shelf and I worked on another section of that same movement, maybe one third of the way through, it's like starting with the octaves. That, that section alone took me a long time to get past it so that I could play it. Then I made a whole section out of that part of the first movement. I went maybe six pages after that, including that section. Then that became my part. Then I was, the last section was the da 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 di the cadenza to the end. You know, and it has so dreadful oxen. Ba 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 bum ba 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 bum di ba 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 bum ba ba. And so I divided the first movement into three different sections. And I could play one section at a time. I didn't have the strength to go ahead and do the second section. And then I'd work up the second section. Then I wouldn't have the strength to go ahead and do the third section. But the time came. Time heals everything. When I could start with the third section that I could play pretty well. And then add the second section to it. Then I could play those two sections through. And it took maybe a month or so of just working on those two sections until I could make one section out of that. And when I could do that, then I could start at the beginning and play for the first time. It was such a triumph for me to play the whole first movement through the Tchaikovsky concerto when I was learning it. That's so, do you ever find that your progress on a piece will suddenly backtrack? You've made all this progress and then for one run reason or another, the progress you seem to have built suddenly becomes lost for whether psychological reasons or physical tiredness. And... Well, that has happened too. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't take defeat easily. I allow myself to be defeated for the day. And then the next day I started again. And then slowly, but very surely, I get to where I want to get. And I felt many, many, many times got a composition. Okay, it's either you or me. And I'm going to win. Um, yeah, that's wonderful, wonderful inspirational material to hear. Um, I'm thinking just, I've covered a, a lot of points that I, I wanted to talk about with you. One thing I'm, I'm curious about is the difference in styles between playing today and say what is called so-called the golden age um, that you grew up in of, of Mr. Rachmaninoff and Corto. I know that, um, I'm sure you know Rachmaninoff's recording of the Chopin uh, E-flat Nocturne. Yeah. It's so beautiful. I think it's so full of uh, rubato. And I think if people played that way today, some people may criticize it a lot for excessive indulgence, rhythmic rubato. So what, as, as someone, again, who's lived almost a century, heard almost a century of uh, evolution of interpretation, do you think that people play, you, you, you're on juries of competitions, do people play differently today than they did 100 years ago? Well, 100 years ago, it was perfectly acceptable to play 
the left hand one way and the right hand another. And my teacher, Mr. Corteau, absolutely played that way and taught me how to play that way. Really? So that the two hands never played any note together. That's going too far. But there's a compromise, you know, where, yes, the hands do not play absolutely together, but the rhythm is being maintained and the melody comes through beautifully. And each person has to arrive at that compromise. And I arrived at a particular compromise. Every piano arrives at their own compromise. Yes. This is the big thing that they have to do alone and right. So that somehow you're obeying the law of rhythm and you're obeying the law of showing what the composer wrote. Yes. And you're obeying your own personal integrity of what an artist can do with a piece of music. They can bend it, but not break it. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Have you had any other um, thoughts, advice, you would uh, like to share with people viewing this possibly thoughts about anything uh, for teachers particularly, um, for students, uh, for concert artists, for managers, for, for anybody um, that you've acquired over your century? Yes, I think I can give you a certain philosophy of performance. Hey. I want my audiences to leave happy because the music made them happy. I tried to remain as true to the performer, to the composer, to the style in which he wrote as I possibly can. But I tried to put an optimistic slant to whatever I do. It is, for instance, you take a sonata like Opus 2, number 3 of Beethoven. Dum, ba -da 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 -dum, bum, bum, bum. I want the line to go up, to go up, or go up, to go up. I want the first movement to not be dum, ba -da 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 -dum, bum, bum, bum. dum, ba -da 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 -dum bum, bum. The music has done nothing. If anything, it has started loud and disappeared. And it starts again and disappears. The music has done nothing. I want the music to make that audience look up. Look up. Because if you look up, you're going to be happier. Yeah. So if I had dum, da 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 dum, bum, bum, bum. I want it go up, go up. I wind up happier doing that. And the audience says, okay, what's next? What's next? 